De'Aaron Fox is having one of the most unbelievable three-point shooting improvements ever. While historically drastic improvement can be seen with players, these kinds of jumps usually occur at a younger age than 26. After six seasons, De'Aaron Fox has seemingly suddenly become an elite shooter in both percentage and volume. While about 20 games isn't the largest sample size, it isn't the smallest either, and I think at this point we can confirm that De'Aaron Fox will be at least somewhere close to what he's doing right now, and even that would be insane. Today I'm going to be going over De'Aaron Fox's season thus far, and why I think this changes everything. Before we get into this, if y'all could like the video, sub the channel, and hit that noti bell, I would really, really appreciate it. It does help me out a ton. Smaller NBA YouTuber trying to grow, so you know what I mean? If y'all rock with NBA content, y'all watch NBA content, looking for a new voice, hey, you know what I mean? I'd appreciate it a ton. And without further ado, let's get right into the video. We all knew De'Aaron Fox was an all-NBA level player, but to me, I see a whole new ceiling for Fox suddenly with this development. While I thought Fox could become a top 7 to 10 level player at his peak, his far from great performance from deep through 6 seasons inevitably led me to not knowing if he could reach best player on a championship team level. Through 6 seasons, De'Aaron Fox shot 32.1% from 3 on 3.8 attempts a night. While in his second season he did shoot over 37% from deep on about 3 attempts a game, in no other season did he shoot over 32% including 2 seasons of sub 30%. I mention all of this to say that currently through 23 games, De'Aaron Fox is shooting 39.6% from deep on 8.6 attempts per game. It is due to the volume and the way I have watched Fox play this year that I am confident that this is here to stay. Fox, evidently, even just watching the game seems like a different animal but the same beast. He still gets to the rim at will and creates all the same, but has also suddenly become a truly elite three-point shooter, and the eye test backs up the numbers. Some of the stuff Fox has been pulling has had me shocked every time I watch the Kings now, and I think I'm starting to just get used to it. But while not being an elite shooter as a guard in the modern NBA doesn't prevent you from being a superstar or even MVP, it has proven since the three-point revolution to take you out of best player on a championship team convos. This was what I assumed would cap De'Aaron Fox's ceiling. I mean, it was essentially in stone after six seasons of evidence. Let me be clear, I love Fox's game then, which makes me even happier that he is taking his game to new heights. This kind of jump this deep into a career just doesn't really happen, and this improvement will drastically alter his career in many ways. Becoming more of a jump shooter with a game like Fox's will be crucial to preserving his burst and extending his prime. Obviously, injuries can happen to anyone, anytime, and Fox will still drive a lot, but you'd have to think that more jump shots will reduce the risk of injury in theory. Extending his effectiveness as a driver works hand in hand with him being more effective when he inevitably loses some of that as he ages, and his shooting and playmaking will keep him elite. While the extending of his career in multiple aspects is great, enough talk about the distant decline, let's talk about the peak that on a 3-5 to five year scale could be unfolding in front of our very eyes. Fox's development as a shooter will completely change how defenses guard him, and thus the entirety of the Kings' already potent offense. While the numbers speak for themselves, I will state once again, basically 40% from deep on nearly 9 attempts a game. But let me show you guys what I mean by saying Fox is on a different level. These aren't in order, but I'm just going to go through a few nights where not only his shot making ability, but also his extreme confidence is shown. Also across many points in time to show that this isn't a fluke. The first game I'm going to dive into was Fox's most recent game against the Portland Trailblazers. While I had written most of this prior to this game, watching this last night was just even more icing on the cake to me that Fox's shooting is here to stay. Last night, Fox shot 7 of 15 from 3, the 15 threes being the most he's ever attempted in a game. Side note, all but two of Fox's top seven three-point attempt games have occurred this season. Fox has played 23 games. Anyways, let's get back to this unreal performance. Another thing that shows me that this shooting is nowhere near a fluke is Fox's shot diet. He isn't crowding the line and taking corner threes. He's taking 27 to 30 footers and making them. He's also taking pull-ups and step backs, not just standstill threes. It's hard to explain completely through graphs and shot charts, but if you've watched pretty much any game Fox has played this year, you definitely see what I'm talking about. Second game I want to go over here is November 19th in Dallas against Luka, Kyrie, and the Mavs. Fox shot 6 of 10 from deep this game with a shot diet that suggests he might be like Tyrese Maxey someday. I'm trolling, well not on the 3 point part I guess, but anyways. Here we see Fox operating around the top of the key much more, hitting multiple setback threes and having an overall unreal performance from deep. The last game I'm going to go over today is Fox's 41 point performance from December 14th against the Oklahoma City Thunder. This night Fox shot 5 of 11 from deep against one of the best teams in the West. While the shot diet in the previous two games wasn't as prevalent, 
we still see Fox being willing to chuck from deep and being very effective while doing it. While we don't see the step backs or pull-ups here, we do see Fox's willingness to shoot from every spot on the court. Before I get on to what this could mean for the future of the Kings and the NBA as a whole, I just want to mention real quick that so far this season, De'Aaron Fox is shooting 39.3% from 25 to 29 feet. This is a result of, I'm sure, a ton of work, and my theory is that the new Curry brand signee got the Curry school of shooting in the deal. While this development will do a ton for Fox individually, including likely securing him an extension that could be in the $300 million range, the impact it will have on the Kings ceiling and thus the NBA as a whole is immense. While this Sacramento team has proven that they can be a mid-tier playoff team, I didn't see much potential for more than that. I thought that this was a team that might find itself in a Western Conference Final one day, but I did not think as currently constructed that they would sniff a title. While I do still agree to some degree, Fox's development not only brings this into question, but also makes building around him much, much easier. The high-powered offense of the Kings can lead to great things. However, we still see scenarios like last night where despite Fox's 43-8-4 and 34-12-5 and from Sabonis, both on great efficiency might I add, the Kings fell to a pretty bad Portland team by 17. While the Kings are obviously significantly better than the Blazers and one game of 82 only means so much, games like this represent the flaw with the Kings to me. Giving up 144 to Boston without Tatum and some blowouts at the hands of Houston and New Orleans also displays how the Kings' current style of play may not be sustainable for deep playoff runs. While this seems grim, the great thing is that not only does Sacramento have the assets to improve, but there are also more than a few names out there that fit the mold of what they need. Any one of Pascal Siakam, OG Ananobi, or Alex Caruso would help this Kings team immensely. This team needs defense badly, and while a rim protecting big is the easiest way to fix that, that's not really going to work with Domas out there. This is why I believe that Sacramento should try and make a big splash this trade season. If they really want a shot, at least one serious move will have to be made, and there are plenty of avenues for that. While prioritizing the future is great, Fox and Domas are both 26 and 27 respectively, which in most cases means they're entering or are in their primes. The other point about pursuing a trade is one that Lou Williams made, if you guys were actually listening and not throwing a fit over a clickbait quote. The point is that the reality of the situation is that Sacramento is not one of the most attractive markets for free agents, but is an outstanding basketball city. Should someone get traded there, them saying put is very likely, a la Chris Webber. But on the open market, Sacramento unfortunately has less to offer in the departments of market and taxes. I think the Kings could undoubtedly get some solid pieces in free agency, but a trade is a much better option in my eyes and it also maximizes this year, while both of your stars are in their primes. To wrap this up, I really don't know the last time I've seen something like this. While shooting was Tyrese Maxey's concern coming out of the draft, as soon as he really started playing, he was an elite shooter. The only example I can think of right now of a player that 5-6 to six or more years deep into their career suddenly became an elite 3-point shooter is Brooke Lopez. But even this was more or less Brooke becoming a standstill 3-point shooter, an outstanding one at that, but still standstill catch and shoot. Such an elite finishing and playmaking guard like De'Aaron Fox suddenly adding a plethora of 3-point shots into his bag is scary, and I'm really really excited to see what it means for him, the Kings, and the NBA as a whole. That's going to wrap this one up. If y'all enjoyed it, please like it up, sub the channel, hit that noti bell. Once again, I would really, really appreciate it. It does help me out a ton. Smaller NBA YouTuber trying to grow. Comment down below, you know what I mean, what you think this Kings team needs. Do you think they need anything? Do you think they got a shot at it this year? Again, man, the West looked like, again, right? Like, you know, Denver, I think you got to give it to Denver right now, obviously. But man, I mean, if Sacramento goes out and gets OG or Pascal or, you know, even a Caruso, again, I think a Caruso would, you know, help them immensely. Even obviously OG and Pascal are going to have a bigger impact. You know, Pascal is an all-star, all-NBA guy, and OG is going to, you know, Caruso is probably a 20, you know, his, his next deal. And this might sound crazy to some people. He's getting at least... 18 million on his next deal. He'll probably get 2025 20, from some team, something like the Bruce Brown deal. But, you know, OG is going to get 30, 35, and Siakam's a 40, 45. I mean, he, he might end up getting 50. So, you know, again, there's a lot of avenues, a lot of caliber, you know, players, you know, if you don't want to give up too, too much. They can, you know, I mean, they have a ton of options, and I really think that, you know, this year, again, stuff is, you know, you, you have Boston who's Boston, but... You know, outside of them, I mean, again, Milwaukee's starting to click. Like, Boston and Milwaukee are, you know, Boston and Milwaukee. Like, you have Damon Giannis and that Boston super team. You know, it's going to be hard. But I feel like, you know, and again, also with, like, OG, like, the OG Siakam thing, like, you would extend them. Like, they're going to be free agents this offseason. You would likely extend them if you were to trade for them. So that's another thing. It's basically just like, you know, I mean, again, you'd have to give up some assets. But my point about this season, my point about you might not have as good a shot in free agency as some bigger markets and some more tax advantageous states. Like, it's just the reality of things, you know. 
it's a really, really unfortunate situation in all honesty, because, you know, like, guys will go to LA or the Warriors or something, and they can justify those taxes by being in that market, but Sacramento gets the taxes and doesn't get the market. It's it's really not a great situation, but hey, Sacramento is making more than the best of it, and they are legit, legit, and that's actually going to wrap this one up. Got on my good tangent at the end. I'll catch you on the next one. Comment any video ideas down below, anything y'all want to see, and I'm out. Peace.